Justine Picardy is a veteran journalist, fashion editor, and author. She started her career as an investigative journalist for the Sunday Times, then became features director of Vogue, editor of The Observer, and editor-in-chief for both Harper's Bazaar and Town and & Country at the same time. She has published six books, including the internationally best-selling biography of Coco Chanel, The Legend and the Life, available at Red Lion Books, and her critically acclaimed memoir, If the Spirit Moves You, First-Hand Meditations on Grief and Spirituality in the Aftermath of Losing Her Sister. Sisterhood returns as a theme in her most recent biography, Miss Dior, a, a Story of Courage and Couture, the story of Catherine Dior and her famous brother during the momentous and traumatic period of World War II. I also wanted to thank Fennec, the Department Store of Distinction founded in 1882, which is this year celebrating its 140th anniversary, and is a pillar of the high street in Colchester and beloved for, of those who know, who live in East Anglia. So um, I'm the moderator for this session, so. Um, and, and then, and interestingly, Justine is such a well-seasoned speaker, she said, I don't want to know a single question before we start the session, <laughs> which I think is fantastic. That, that is exactly what EA Festival is about, even though I said it was not going to be about seat of the pants this year. Um, okay, so. Justine, being a very eminent fashion editor, it was utterly natural for her, after the huge success of this book, to publish a book, to write a book about Christ, uh, Christine Dior, who she considers to be one of the central pillars of the fashion industry of the 20th century. And yet, this book ended up being um, largely focused on the sister of Christine Dior, Catherine Dior, instead. So I think the first question is, and, and because it's also unconventional, it's an unconventional approach to what ordinarily would have been a, a, a fashion biography. Justine, why did you decide to change course? And had you, had you actually started off with that intention? Was it midstream during your research? What happened? What happened was, yes, after the Chanel book was published, I received an invitation from Dior to look at their archives um, with a view to perhaps doing a biography of Christian Dior because there hadn't been an English language biography of Dior and the two great figures I would say not just of fashion but fashion in that in an overlapping landscape with with art and with the wider culture are for me Chanel and Dior so I went to uh, the Dior archives in Paris and they were wonderful. They were filled with beautiful artifacts. So the extraordinary couture gowns, Christian Dior's beautiful illustrations um, for the drawings that he, he used for, for his creations. But it was primarily visual. So what I thought it would make would be a wonderful exhibition at the V&A and that came to pass so I was the person to suggest to both uh, the V&A and um, Dior that they should come together and do an exhibition and eventually it happened and it became the Dior Designer of Dreams exhibition at the V&A which is the most successful exhibition the V&A has ever put on. Um, but I to write a book, I mean, I started out, as, as you mentioned, as an investigative journalist for the Sunday Times in my early 20s. And, and I've always moved between um, journalism, editing, and writing books. And to, to write a book, you've really got to be possessed by a subject because it's such a long marathon. At least for me, I have to feel possessed. And I was really interested in Christian Dior, but I couldn't see my way into a book about him. I kept starting and it stopping, and I was editing Harper's Bazaar as well, and Town and & Country at the same time, so I had a pretty full-on job. Um, but then one day, um, I was sitting with one of the Dior archivists in... Um, Christian Dior's incredibly beautiful chateau in the south of France in rural Provence. And he had created the most beautiful garden there. And also there are rose meadows there because it's the heart of the rose growing area for the perfume industry. And he sort of gestured and said, just 
not far from here, just a couple of kilometers away, is where Christian Dior and his sister Catherine lived together during the Second World War, grew vegetables together, and then Catherine went on growing roses, which were used for the famous Miss Dior perfume, which was named in her honor. And I thought, that's really interesting. Why has this woman who he lived with, who is his inspiration for the most famous perfume in the world, along with Chanel Number no. 5, why is nobody talking about her? And then he said almost as if, by way of afterthought, oh, um, and she was in the French Resistance and she was sent to a concentration camp. And I just, I couldn't, and I said, but why is, you never told me about this before? And he said, he sort of shrugged, you know, we were speaking in French, as if, oh, well, it's not very interesting. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and at that moment, I just thought, in order to understand Christian Dior, I have to understand Catherine. And so began a really long quest in search of both Catherine and in writing about Catherine, I felt that was the only way I could write about Christia, but also the elusive figure of Miss Dior herself, who is partly Catherine, but she is also this idealized vision of femininity and heightened sense of beauty and magic and enchantment in the immediate aftermath of a horrendously ugly war, a war in which... Dior's beloved younger sister, the woman he was closest to in the world, had suffered terribly. How could all those different things coexist? And why was it that history had forgotten to remember Catherine Dior? And also, why was it that history did not put D Christian Dior in his true place in the narrative to create the most important new look straight after the war ends, a look that changed the way women dress, just as Chanel changed the way women dressed in the aftermath of the First World War. So that's what the book's about. <laughs> that was a very useful exposition of a lot of the book. Um, and also, by way of that, I wanted to ask you, so how long did it take you to write the two books, respectively? And why don't you also share with us a bit of the modus operandi that you typically pursue when you're authoring a, a book, a biography in this case? Well, both um, books, I, the, 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 the research for my Chanel book, although I didn't know at the time it would become a book, um, started in sort of the end of 97, beginning of 1998, when I interviewed Karl Lagerfeld for the first time, and who was the creative director of Chanel. And um, he's, he was really fascinating. And thanks to him, I... And he was a voracious reader oh, yeah. as well, yeah. really importantly. And I'd already... Um, I mean, he liked my writing and we got on well. And he's really interested in history and in ghosts, as indeed I am. Anyway, thanks to him, I began to sort of be given access to the Chanel archives, but also to Chanel's private apartment um, above her boutique in Rue Cambon. And it's such a... I'm always interested in places where the sort of veil between the past and the present becomes translucent, where, you know, you feel that, and there's places in each of my books where you feel that if you looked in a mirror, you might just catch a reflection of somebody who had once lived in that place and is no longer there. So the Chanel book was published in 2010 and I'd really started to doing the research in the late 90s. So, you know, for me, it is a slow process. Um, similarly, my first trip to the Dior archives was to end of 2010. The book was published in 2020. But the way I write, and this is probably goes back to my early training as an investigative reporter but also even earlier I've always loved looking at old manuscripts and archives I studied literature at, in, at Cambridge and 
Cambridge is sort of wonderful because you can go to the university library and see the original manuscripts of you know that are written by the writers you're reading and there is something so magical about looking at you know a letter or a manuscript and the ink on the page you know has been put there by the person that you're interested in it's the same with sketches um so yes it each time it took a long time but I also always want to go to the places that I'm writing about so I go on a journey in Chanel's case her apartment in Paris um, I even slept in the bedroom in the, at her bedroom in the Ritz uh, the, the Catholic medieval orphanage where she'd grown up in the late 19th century um, that was part of a, a convent um, I even stayed slept in one of the little sort of iron beds where the orphans had once slept where Chanel had been and similarly for this book I went to the Dior family home in Granville overlooking the coast of Normandy um, I went to the apartment that Christiane and Catherine shared in Paris I went to the farm they shared in Provence I stayed there I stayed at Dior's own um, home in Provence and I also went to Ravensbrück the concentration camp where Catherine was deported to I went to twice and I traced her journey from France to Germany and then to a series of sub camps where she had um, worked as a as a slave laborer and so those journeys I kind of I go on them as a writer, but then I want to take the reader with me on those journeys. And to, to write about the, the horror of the Second World War, I, and to write about Ravensbrück, um, which was Hitler's only concentration camp for women, where Catherine Dior was sent to, um, I wanted readers to be able to come with me there. So sometimes I'm writing in the first person, so that so that you're there in the present with me as well as being able to look back into the past. Oh, for sure. One of the most uh, unique things about your writing of biography is the interleaving of your own self-experiences and identity into these books. Yeah, because... There's it makes no, them very modern. And that, Exactly, say. because, you know, conventional history has it that there is just one version of history. And, of course, you know, history can be told in so many different ways... I also feel that that um, fashion and indeed gardens and both um, Christian and Catherine Dior were passionate gardeners are too often excluded from mainstream history because they're seen as being somehow frivolous. And yet, you know, they're so close to us. I mean, the clothes we wear are so intimate. They're the closest things, you know, to our skin, as is the perfume that, that we may choose to wear and similarly with gardens and normally the history of of war is told through the history of armies and generals and presidents and and dictators of course and all that is very important but to be able to look at history through the lives of women like Catherine Dior and other women who were in the resistance with her and who were deported to concentration camps, it's, they are so often excluded. And so I don't believe that there's just one version. I mean, there's multiple versions of, being, of telling the same events. And I want to acknowledge that, in, in, hence some of what I write is in the first person. I'm not a kind of authorial god who knows everything. I mean, of course, because history is to some extent apocryphal and extremely opinionated anyway. But I also wanted to say th something to all of you history buffs out there. I think that many times people think, okay, this, these books are about fashion designers. I'm a man. I'm not going to read them. I think that one of the things that's so wonderful about these books is because I, I personally wouldn't necessarily have felt attracted to reading about a Chanel or a Christian Dior, but they actually are these incredible epochal sna snapshots of life through a different lens from the viewpoint of an industry which is actually typically sidelined on the subject of, for example, war. And on 
that note, I actually want to segue into my next question, is, uh, which is that because they lived, I mean, I would say, Chanel, to give you the timeline about their lives, the lives in question. So Chanel was 35 when World War I ended, whereas um, Catherine Dior and her brother were, let me see here, 40 and 28. Catherine was her, the younger sister of Christian Dior. So actually, if you think about their lives and, and, and the fact that they were both in the fashion industry, it provides a very rich source of comparison. So on that note also, I mean, I think what's interesting also, because I, I read these two books back to back to, to compare them and interview Justine, is to, act, is to ask Justine, what were some of the biggest differences in terms of, of similarities and differences um, the, the style of fashion, the fashion industry, the wartime treatment or the wartime policies affecting the fashion industry during both those wars, which were radically different, and how about their personalities? Now, that's a huge umbrella kind of question, but I think this is a very fertile ground, and this is actually what, when we, this is our, our thumbnail prep for this. This is actually something that, um, that I think Justine and I really want to think, think will be very interesting for you. Well, Chanel was born in 1883, so she was born in the 19th century, which is extraordinary when you think she is the woman who defines how modern women look and how modern women still look. Chanel takes away corsets. Um, you know, I'm looking around, I can see stripy tops and, you know, stripy blazers and, and trousers. I mean, Chanel allows women to wear trousers. She's the first woman that popularizes cutting one's, you know, the hair short. So she's incredibly influential, but she's born into poverty, illegitimate daughter of a traveling peddler um, who was never there for his family. Her mother died um, when Chanel was just 11 years old and their father um, abandoned his five children and Chanel and her two sisters were abandoned to live in this um, orphanage. Uh, in the middle of a remote region of, of France called the Auvergne, where they were raised by Catholic nuns. And then she never talked about her childhood. She reinvents her childhood. Um, she opens her first boutique in 1910. Um, she is given the money to do so by her lover. So she still needs to take that conventional, you know, she could have become, when she left the Orphan as she could have become um, a, a nun, uh, a seamstress, and she did become a seamstress, and then she became a mistress, and that was part of her route out, but she was also ferociously independent. And then she really comes to fame during the First World War, when you know women are working, even if even if they're upper class women, um, you know they're in the Red Cross, they're driving ambulances, they, they're having to take on roles that were not allowed to them before. And she introduces um, soft sort of stripy tops, um, loose trousers, she cuts her hair, and that becomes incredibly popular. And then her lover, the one who'd given her the money to set up in business, who was an English woman uh, called Boy Capel, He's a captain during the First World War. He survives the First World War, unlike so many, but then he dies in a car crash in 1919. And so Chanel, he'd actually already broken her heart once by marrying an upper-class English aristocrat, but continuing to have an affair with, with Coco Chanel. And then um, he's killed in a car crash in 1919. And like so many women, it's the aftermath of the First World War and the first global flu pandemic in which her own sister had died. So, so many women are wearing black and Chanel herself goes into mourning and wears black and then does something incredibly radical, which is she turns black the color of mourning, which has been so associated with the absolute, you know, decimated population of Europe, she turns it into the little black dress and which is associated with the independent woman of the jazz age in the 1920s. She also at the same time launches Chanel number no. five and that is associated with the modern independent woman. So those things, and that's, and she also becomes an independent woman 
her, her, she continues to have relationships. She had, you know, many lovers, but she never married. She always remained Gabrielle Coco Chanel. Christian and Catherine Dior are. Catherine is born in 1917. Um, Dior is born. Her brother Christian is born before the First World War. They are born into a very different background, that of the haute bourgeoisie. Um, their father had inherited a 19th century family business, which was a fertilizer, um, fertilizer factories in Normandy. And in those days, the name Dior was associated with the stench of guano, which was imported for the fertilizer factory. So where they lived, if the wind blew in the wrong direction, the townsfolk would say, oh, it smells of Dior today. <laughs> um, so they were born into prosperity, very, very different upbringing to Chanel. But then they too are affected by the First World War. So their older brother, um, who had joined up as soon as he was able to, still a teenager, and was the only soldier in his division in the French army not to be killed in the trenches of the First World War. And he survived, but had shell shock and PTSD, became estranged from the father. Their other brother developed schizophrenia, and their mother died of septicemia. And then their father lost all his money in the aftermath of the Wall Street crash. So they were left with nothing, and they both had to earn a living. So Dior, Christian, who had been shown great aesthetic judgment as a modern art dealer, his gallery um, in Paris, he'd shown Picasso, Matisse, Dali. Um, he was affected by the, uh, by the Wall Street crash. His last sale had been a Dali called The Persistence of Memory, which he managed to sell to an American collector for $250. That was his final sale. That painting most recently sold for $250 million. But he said, you know, at this time, you couldn't give away surrealist art, let alone make a living from it. So he had to do something pragmatic. Just as Chanel had to earn a living, so too did Christian Dior. So he taught himself to draw. He became a fashion illustrator for newspapers and magazines, including Harper's Bazaar, at a time when before photography was the preeminent form of visual expression. And then his sketches he began to sell on a freelance basis to couturiers. And at this point, his sister Catherine, who was his best friend as well as his sister, came to live with him in Paris and he got her a job. And there are some pictures. That's her when she just starts working for um, in what's called a Maison de Mode, which was an accessories house. And she also becomes her brother's first model. And there are those pictures of her as her brother's first model wearing early Christian Dior designs, but before he's the famous Christian Dior. Then the outbreak of the Second World War. Christian joins up as a soldier in the French army. Um, the French army is, is utterly, falls apart with the German invasion. Um, France falls very rapidly. Paris is declared an open city. The Vichy regime is set up, which becomes a viciously collaborationist regime, um, which enacts its own anti-Semitic legislation. It doesn't need the Nazis to tell them to do it. They do it of their own accord. And fortunately for Christian, he's not taken prisoner of war and he manages to make his way back to Provence where, to this little farmhouse where his father had bought after going bankrupt and his sister is there too. And Christian and Catherine do something very pragmatic in a time of war, which is to start growing vegetables because somebody has to grow the food to eat and there's no food because of rationing. So by 19, end of 41, they ha are completely broke and finding it really hard, apart from vegetables, to get anything to eat. So Christian makes the decision to return to Paris, where the couture industry is up and running again. And he gets a job working for a designer called Lucienne Lelong. Catherine, meanwhile, takes her first step 
in joining the French resistance, which is to go and get a radio, because she wanted to get a radio to listen to General de Gaulle's band broadcasts on the BBC, um, calling on the French to resist. And when Catherine joins the French resistance, just so few people do. I had thought before I started researching her story that sort of everybody resisted because that's the myth. In fact, she was one of only 100,000 active members of the French resistance in a population of 40 million. This was in the early 40s. Even at the height of the resistance, which is after D-Day and um, at the time of the liberation of Paris, there were 400,000. That's 1% of the population. And therein lies the reason why her, why her story was forgotten, because there was so much shame in the aftermath of the war about the extent of collaboration. The humiliation of occupation and the shame of collaboration. Anyway, during her time in the resistance, first of all, she's operating in the south of France, then she returns to Paris and lives with her brother in the same flat they had shared before the outbreak of war. And Christian, he's working for Lucien Lelong's Couture House, but he's also sheltering Catherine, who's working full-time for the resistance, what a particular network of the resistance called F2, which is an intelligence gathering network. And they... They weren't kind of, you know, shooting Germans and blowing up bridges. They were gathering vital intelligence for the Allies, and they actually were reporting into British intelligence, the SIS, in London, as well as to Polish intelligence in London. Um, and the, the intelligence that Catherine and her comrades, many of whom were young women in the resistance, gathered in this network was vital for the D-Day landings. The Allies could not have landed at Normandy without her information. So Christian is operating in this completely schizophrenic way. So their apartment is in the centre of Paris, Rue Royale, overlooking Maxims, which is where the Nazi officers and collaborators gather. Swastikas are hanging on the street. And... It's a very complicated position for Christian because, I mean, there is a myth that it was just the wives and mistresses of Nazi officers who bought couture during, in Paris during the Second World War. Actually, at Lucien Lelong, they didn't have any German clients, but they did have the clients of the black marketeers and the collaborators and the French, um, you know, high-ranking officials in the collaborationist regime. And there's a very telling scene that I describe in my book. Um, his friend and colleague at Lucien Le Long, who was another designer, was Pierre Balmain. And Balmain describes how Dior, they're standing behind a screen, you know, watching the couture show and they're watching the audience who sit on little red chairs like you are with gilt frames. And, um, and Dior, Christian says to Balma, just think all these women are going to be shot wearing their long dresses, i.e. the war will come to an end, France will liberate itself, and these people who were complicit in the occupation, you know, will get their just desserts. So clearly his sympathy was with his sister and the resistance. Anyway, Catherine is betrayed in July 1944 by a French collaborator, a young woman like herself, who has infiltrated her network. She's arrested and she's tortured by the Gestapo. And although the particular unit of the Gestapo that tortures her um, has a German self-proclaimed captain, um, most of the members of the unit are French. And again, until I started researching Catherine's story, I had no idea that there were French members of the Gestapo. They were called the Gestapiste, and they did everything, you know, from arrest to torture. Um, it was French police, the French gendarmes, who rounded up the Jews. There were French internment camps. There were 
concentration camps in France. Anyway, Catherine, when she was tortured, did not give away a single name. And in doing so, she saved her brother's life. She saved her lover's life, who was in the resistance with her. And she saved her best friend's life, who um, was another young woman in the resistance. And everybody else in her particular unit, she, she saved their lives by remaining silent. And she was deported on the last train out of Paris before the liberation of Paris, just days before the liberation in August. They could literally hear the Allied gunfire that was just, you know, no more than 20 or 30 miles outside Paris. But again, I think there's this myth that after the D-Day landings, it was all then very quick. It wasn't... Apparently, as many people died between D-Day and the liberation of Paris, as many soldiers died as during the whole of the First World War. You know, it was a, those hard-fought battles. And the Germans put up a very, very stiff, you know, defence and carried on believing that they were going to win the war. So to deport those prisoners that Catherine was one of was because, you know, they believed they were... They were, you know, they would come back. So, not the prisoners, that is. The Germans believed that they were still going to win. So, Catherine was on a train with 2,000 men and 400 women. And on this train with Catherine, and I trace the stories of the other women, many of the other women on the train were British women in the SOE, SOE agents. There was an American woman whose husband was French and who'd been helping the French resistance. Um, and there were French women who were also in the resistance, like Catherine. The men were sent to Buchenwald concentration camp and the women to Ravensbrück. Christian did everything he could to get Catherine off that train and couldn't. Um, so she crossed into Germany just as Paris was being liberated. And then she was taken to Ravensbrück concentration camp, which was Hitler's only concentration camp for women. And, I mean, I know we have to return to Chanel. I haven't got time to talk about what happened to her there, but it is all there in the book. Okay. That's why I don't have to ask any questions. She doesn't need to prepare. <laughs> that was amazing, Justine. Um, actually, you alluded to my next question, which... Unfortunately, we can't, you can't probably spend as, give as lengthy a, of, of an answer, but I wanted to also ask you whether, in, you, you give a very detailed and nuanced account of whether Chanel was a collaborator, and I think it's a subject that is um, it's, it, very welcome because it was so, it teases through the different strands, but if you could summarize it a little bit, because I think it's a question which everybody wants to ask who loves history. Yeah, so I Number one, I've done more research into Coco Chanel and Christian Dior than anybody else has. I have read my way through the archives of the French resistance. I have read my way through the archives of the post-war military investigation into the French Gestapo. And I have also read my way through the archives of, um, of what Chanel did during the war and that involved going in part through Winston Churchill's pri private archives because Winston Churchill was a great friend, a close friend of Chanel's from before the war. Chanel is scapegoated as having been a collaborator because she had an uh, affair with a German officer in Paris during the occupation. She started the affair when her nephew, who everybody believed her nephew, was her nephew, but may well have been her son. She, he was supposedly the illegitimate son of her sister who died. In fact, there's quite a lot of anecdotal evidence that he was her son. He, like Christian Dior, had been in the French army at the time of the invasion uh, at the Second World War. Unlike Dior, he was captured and made, taken a prisoner of war, and he was taken to a German camp where she got news that he was dying of, of consumption, or you know TB, which is what had killed her mother. And I think she took a decision, you know, that she would do anything to save him. So she found 
a, somebody in, you know who had an English mother who se- and a German father who seemed suave and sophisticated uh, gave the appearance of not being a Nazi but you know a good German and he managed um, through him her son slash nephew was released and was able to return to France. Now what Chanel did compared to what many people in France did was really, well, she did what many people did. She did what it took to survive and to keep alive the people that she loved. And that's what most people did. That's why only 100,000 people resisted. She wasn't doing business with the Germans in the way that most industrialists did. She closed her couture house. She said the war was no time to be doing, making fashion. So compared to the men in the couture industry, like Marcel Rocha, Jacques Fath, who were actively doing business and who were actively pro-Nazi, you know, she... I don't, I, I don't, listen, I don't condone what she did. I'm half Jewish. I have family who, you know, who died in the Holocaust, who were European Jews, some of whom ended up in France. So I'm not whitewashing Chanel, but she certainly was scapegoated. And basically nobody really was punished after the war. Just as in, in Germany, you know, eight million people were actively involved in the Nazi machinery, actively working for it. And the Allies took the decision. Yes, there were some show trials, the Nuremberg trials, but very few people went to prison. Ravensbrück, where thousands and thousands of women died, only 33 people were put on trial. And it was a British trial in Hamburg. It was a British-run court. 33 people were put on trial out of the thousands of people that had worked there. There was a slave labor factory in Germany, in in Ravensbrück run by Siemens, because all those big German brands, BMW, Siemens, you know, Krupp, Bosch, were part of the Nazi machine. You know, they're, they're... they were all their board were leading mem- leading Nazis. Siemens had a, a slave labor factory, and Catherine was part of a regime called extermination through labor. There was a gas chamber at Ravensbrück, but if you were young and healthy enough, as Catherine was, you the extermination through labor program was to be worked to death. So she, there was a Siemens factory, there was a BMW factory. Nobody from Siemens involved in those slave labor factories was ever put on trial, nor from BMW. So, so when you, you know, read as you will do, because there's going to be a big Chanel exhibition at the V&A next, starting in September next year, and there are, is also an Apple TV series that's being filmed right now called The New Look, which is undoubtedly partly based on my research, but Chanel is being played by Juliette Binoche. Maisie Williams, who's a young star of Game of Thrones, is playing Catherine Dior. I mean, I'll be interested to see how Chanel is portrayed, but I do think that when I read, oh, Chanel was a Nazi, it's much more complicated than that. When what she finally did, and again, it was a stupid thing to do, but she tried, she got involved in a plot to try and bring the war to an early end. So there was this idea that because she was friends with Churchill, she would get a message to Churchill saying that there were elements within um, the German high command, as indeed there there were, um, many of whom were then executed because of this plot, um, who wanted, the, who thought Hitler was mad and they wanted the war to come to an end. So the idea was because of Chanel's friendship with Chanel, uh, with Churchill, she would be able to arrange a meeting with him on neutral tra- territory. The idea was she would go to Madrid and she would say these leading figures in German high command think Hitler's a lunatic and they want the war to come to an end. That's the true story. So Dior was obviously, you know, much more involved in 
the resistance by supporting his sister. Nevertheless, he worked for Lucien Lelong, and Lelong was head of what was called the Chambre Syndicale, which was the head of all the couture houses. They inevitably, like anybody who was in business, whether you were a waiter at the Ritz, you know, a hairdresser, a, an industrialist, a, you know, a civil servant, you were doing business with the Germans. Either you resisted and joined the resistance and went underground, as Catherine did, or you, to some degree, collaborated. I mean, Simone de Beauvoir, you know, took a job at um, a college because the person that had that job was Jewish and was deported. You know, she didn't join the resistance. But nobody says Simone de Beauvoir was a collaborator. But is that any diff is it different? Similarly, um, Sartre, you know, continued to, to write, to work, to teach within that regime. So it's, and Cocteau was, you know, the person in researching both of my books, because he happened to be great friends with both Chanel and Dior. I went through Coc John Cocteau's correspondence and there he is having lunch with the head of the Paris police and he says oh Hitler's a genius and nobody should get in his way and yet Cocteau continues to be lionized as a sort of hero of French intellect you know intellectualism anyway it's a complicated subject yeah. that well, I could talk about for far longer than we have today <laughs> Yes, and um, on that note, I wanted to open the floor to questions. Um, and my own intention had, to, had been to talk to Justine also about her career and also your own. How you, when um, Joanne said to me, so these are all the things that I want to cover, and I <laughs> wanted to say to her, that's a lot to cover in 45 minutes. But anyway, if anybody no, has that any was riveting. questions. That was riveting. Any questions? Yes. Please. I'm a fluent French reader. So just the question is, how did I understand the archives I was reading? It's a really good question. Um, I can read French. Um, I used to be fluent in French, but the thing is, when you go to France now, particularly Paris, if I start speaking French, they all switch to English. And <laughs> English is now the language of the fashion industry because there's so many designers and people working for the French, big French houses that are not from, are not French, that everybody automatically speaks English. Um, but anyway, yes, the, it was really hard because a lot is handwritten. And when I was going through, I found some of Catherine Dior's handwritten statements about what had happened to her at the hands of the French Gestapo. And her handwriting was reasonably clear. Dior's handwriting is quite hard to decipher, Christian's handwriting. And then there were other handwritten statements that were really hard to read. But I was very fortunate because, and some of them, you know, the archivists couldn't read. But then um, uh, I've got two close friends who are sisters, and we haven't even begun to talk about why sisterhood matters to me. Yeah. But anyway, their mother... Um, is is a historian and translator and her <laughs> i mean she's retired she's an academic but her sort of speciality in academia was reading handwriting of the 1940s in France so when i got really <laughs> stuck i would send it to her so that's how i managed now i have one quick question to wrap it up i wanted to ask what are you working on now what's your next project um, it's a book um, about gardens, which is interesting after, oh. but it's memoir as well. It's, it's, it's more, as anybody who's read my first book, which is about my sister and her death, and anybody who's read Miss Dior will know that memoir does come into all my writing. Um, I mean, it, it's, you know, it will be about other people as well as me, but I'm in the very early stages, so I can't tempt the writing gods by saying any more. <laughs> okay, on that note, please uh, put your hands together for the Justine. <laughs> <laughs>